Okay. I need the prayer, sorry. Yeah, I need prayers too. <laughs> All right, I got... My mom just texted me from why we started. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The March 20th meeting of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education will now come to order. Please stand for tonight's invocation, followed by the pledge to the flag. <clears throat> oh, God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this meeting of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education. This meeting is being televised live on AACPS TV and live streamed on the internet. General information and protocols for the meeting are posted on the sign by the doorway as you enter the room, so please make sure you read those if you have not all right already. At this time, I'd like to uh, announce here that one of our former colleagues and a former Board of Education president, Michael McNally, passed away earlier this month. He served on this board from 1995 to 2005 and as board president for years during that time period. On behalf of the Anne Arundel County Board of Education, we extend our deepest sympathies to his family. Also tonight, it is a pleasure to have with us the longest serving female senator in the history of the United States Senate and a champion uh, of education, Senator Barbara Mikulski. We are also very, very honored to have with us uh, the family of former delegate Ted Sophocles, including his wife, delegate Alice Sophocles, and members of, of her family. And uh, they will be taking part in tonight's recognition in just a few minutes. So thank you all for being here. Item 2.03 is approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve the minutes. And second? Second. Okay, discussion, Mrs. Schalheim. Um, yes, now I, I know that we, we don't get into like the little nitty gritty details. However, it's been omitted from the school community highlights that I also um, attended the tribute to women of color breakfast and also so I, I want that added please and then under the workforce um, presentation um, a bunch of us were delighted by the adjunct professor um, program and um, and also asked questions about that those were the two things I noticed in the in the minutes Okay, so taking those edits into account, um, are there any other edits to the minutes? Seeing none at this time, uh, we'll approve the minutes as revised by consensus. Okay. Thank you. Uh, item 2.04 is established agenda order. Would any member like to add anything to the agenda that's not currently on the printed agenda? Seeing none, the agenda will stand as published. Item 2.05 is recognitions. Good evening, President Gilliland, Vice President Urea, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. I am Chris Truffer, Regional Assistant Superintendent for the South River and Arundel Clusters, and it is my distinct honor and great pleasure to present this evening's recognition. Before I go any further, I'd like to ask the members of the board and Dr. Arlotto to come forward, please.
Members of the board and Dr. Arlotto, tonight we recognize a student and a family that personified dedication and commitment to the first, and I believe the most important value in our school system's strategic plan. All means all. This is a very special recognition to me as my daughter Jane has gotten to know Rosa Marcelino and her family personally over the years. To be quite honest, I'm pinching myself that I'm actually here bringing this recognition. It's, it's an honor to be here. A decade ago as a student at Central Elementary School, Rosa became the face of a movement to eradicate a demeaning and disparaging label for people with intellectual disabilities from state and federal language. When told that the school was required to labor, label her daughter who has Down syndrome as mentally retarded on IEP documents, Rosa's mother, Nina, who is now a special educator at Central Special School, refused to accept that fate. Rosa, Nina, and the entire Marcelino family set out to find a legislative ally who would be sympathetic to the issues faced by people with disabilities and who would join their effort to raise awareness of the power of language and insist that their voices of those being labeled be heard. They found such an ally in State Delegate Ted Sophocles, who sponsored the original state legislation 10 years ago this year to erase the stigmatizing label and replace it with the term intellectual disability, or preferably using person first language, a person with an intellectual disability. As that legislation was working its way through the State House, the Marcelinos were fortunate to have found another ally, now at the national level, in Senator Barbara Mikulski. In a powerful speech on the Senate floor with a photo of Rosa next to her, Senator Mikulski called the legislation, quote, a law on behalf of this little girl and on behalf of all of the children of the United States of America who are labeled, stigmatized, and bear a burden the rest of their lives because of the language we use in the law books." Unquote. Senator Mikulski also drew upon the words spoken by Rose's older brother, Nick, in his testimony before the Maryland General Assembly and in response to the recurring question, why do you care what we call Rosa when what matters is how we treat her? In that testimony, Nick explained, what you call people is how you treat them. Nick's quote would end up being repeated several months later in the White House East Room. Senator Mikulski's legislation passed and Rosa's law was signed by President Barack Obama on September 22, 2010, with all of the Marcelinos in attendance. Since that time, Rosa and her family have continued to advocate for the rights of people with disabilities to be fully included in all aspects of life. In addition to continuing to speak out on this issue, Rosa leads by example through her work with Best Buddies and one of my favorite organizations, Special Olympics. She is also a student athlete participating in our school system's unified sports programs for South River High School. There are times that we as adults need to stand back and not just observe, but learn from the powerful leadership qualities our children possess. Rosa is just such a child and the work she and her family have done is just such a case. In addition to Rosa and Nina, we are truly honored to have with us here tonight, as mentioned by Mr. Gilliland, Senator Mikulski, who took time from her still busy schedule to be with us for this recognition. We are equally honored to have Delegate Sophocles' wife, Alice, who succeeded him as a state delegate and members of the Sophocles family here this evening. We want to give them an opportunity to say a few words, but first I'd like to invite them along with Rosa and Nina, of course, forward for a photo. As they come up, please join me in thanking them enthusiastically for their collective efforts to show us that words truly do matter and that they can make a world of difference. Thank you, Rosa.
I feel good about it. <laughs> Good evening uh, to the members of the Anne Arundel County uh, School Board and to the faculty and to the staff of the school system and to anyone watching on TV. It's a wonderful honor to be here tonight as you give recognition to Rosa, a pretty brave, outstanding young lady, and to her family. But I'd like to take a minute, first of all, to expend to the people of Anne Arundel County, to the school board, and to the faculty, the support staff, this wonderful, unique role that you play here in providing a compassionate, because of the outstanding job you do, meaning Anne Arundel County board, Department of Education, Anne Arundel County is a compassionate post for our military. Our military often are stationed at Fort Meade, particularly if they're in the Army, if they have a special needs child, because the great school system you have and the programs you provide for the children in need with these special and unique abilities, and because of access to great institutions like Kennedy Krieger, Hopkins, University of Maryland, and the NIH. You play a very unique role, and that's what brought me to a round table in 2009. I came to Central uh, Elementary School in April 6, 2009, to have a round table on special education. President Obama had been elected in a stimulus package. He was putting money into special ed. I knew what you were doing here, and I wanted to learn from you so we didn't waste the money when we sent it out, we would make good use. At that round table was a mother with a button on of that young lady up there that you see, Rosa now, all ready, well, a junior now. And Mrs. Marcelino, that's when we met, told me about what was happening to her daughter Rosa and to other children with Down syndrome and other ch uh, intellectual challenges that what one had been considered a social advancement, which was to call the children in that group 
uh, retarded that the R word had become an epithet often resulting in bullying and harassment. She asked if I would change the law. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. She told me about Nick. She told me about Ted Sophocles. I thought, well, that's a great guy to hang around with. I knew him. <laughs> we all know and how much we loved him, our pharmacist friend. And I said, it had to pass Maryland law so we would not be in conflict, that it would not be in contradiction with any federal law, and also it would not eliminate the benefits for any child, Social Security, a private trust, et cetera. I went back to Washington to start my work, and I found out another senator, Mike Enzi of Wyoming, was also involved in this. We teamed up. Hard to believe. He's red state. I'm blue state. He's Republican. I'm Democrat. Our voting records diverge. But he's a man of unfailing civility and old school sensibility. When we talked about it, he had a young lady in his state. Mike is a professional accountant. He said, let me go to all of those that are involved in these benefit laws and estate planning and so on. And I took my social work background and I went to work to talk to all the groups involved so we could be on the same team. See, we decided we weren't red or blue. We decided we were red, white, and blue. And we were going to stand up for America's children. We put aside political differences, worked shoulder to shoulder, did our homework so there'd be no negative and unintended consequence. And we passed the law. It was passed and signed into law on October 10th. We went to the White House for a signing. The Marcelino family was there and had a chance to meet the president. And there's Rosa up there. And this goes to what I've said, and I'll conclude by this. I often have said, the best ideas come from the people. This idea came from the people. Not a think tank, not a professionally paid lobbyist, not anything wrong with that, but from grassroots. And then the other saying is, each and every one of us can make a difference, but when we work together, we can make change. And I think, really, this is a salute. At a time when people wonder about democracy, when you see the Marcelino family and you know what we did together, if you work at democracy, democracy works. And let me conclude by saying this. In September, the Enoch Pratt will open its renovated library. I have placed in the hands of the Enoch Pratt, the Medal of Freedom that President Obama awarded me. And Rosa came to see me shortly after that with her Special Olympics medal, in which she presented to me as well. So when the Enoch Pratt opens this, there's going to be like a little area saluting me. And we're going to have the Medal of Freedom, but we're also going to have the Special Olympics and we're going to have the Rosa button that really launched a, an educational revolution. You see, we can make it all work if we work together and put political differences aside. God bless all of you, and God bless America that we hold so dear. Thank you very much, Senator Mikulski, and thank you for all that, that you have done and continue to do. Uh, this time, Delegate Alice so Sophocles. Um, I'm not going to add much. I think the Senator said it all, but I just want to thank you all, and I also want to thank Rosa. And, and her whole family, including her brother, who was very active in this bill. And Ted was so proud, and I won't be able to say much more, but he took great pride in this bill and, and enjoyed the family, Rosa and her family, very much. Thank you.
Thank you, and and to the Sophocles family. Um, on a personal note, I, I will say I had the the honor and privilege of of serving with Ted, and I know he's looking down now, smiling. Um, he is somebody that uh, I think all of us aspired to be like him because of of people I, I had the privilege to serve with down there. I don't know anybody who had a bigger heart. And I miss Ted. I know you do as well. So thank you for being here as well. Um, at this time, um, I would just ask, uh, as, as we close out this presentation, uh, for any families with special needs members to please stand and be recognized now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we'll uh, move uh, to the rest of our agenda. Item 2.06, School and Community Highlights. Mrs. Ellis. Well, I've been quite busy the last couple of weeks. Um, I got my very first opportunity to see Rock and Roll Revival at Severna Park High School. Um, my kids are very involved in the arts and they always get to go and tell me about it, but I'm always too late to snag those tickets. But I got there this time, it's amazing. Um, so many truly talented kids. For me personally, I feel like the band was the MVP. They're amazing, but um, fun, fun show. Everyone should go, they do it every year. Um, I also went to the National History Day Awards and um, that was also a very rewarding experience for me. Just hearing the titles of the work made me really ponder how deep these kids are, are studying history and, and where they come up with these ideas for these topics is just phenomenal. I also attended the uh, PVA Theater One Acts uh, performance and uh, that, that at Annapolis High School. That was lots of fun. And I want to make um, a plug for two shows that I know that I'm going to be attending coming up. One is uh, Once on this Island at Mead High School opening uh, April 4th through 6th. And uh, that is one of my very favorite musicals. And also Little Mermaid at Annapolis High School April 5th through 14th. I'll be going there too. Thank you. Mrs. Shawheim. Thank you. Um, I also attended Rock and Roll High School. It was incredible. I just can't get over how well the students' voices were matched with the song. So if you closed your eyes, like Janis Joplin was in the room. Um, uh, what was the other one that stuck out to me? Um, well, they all stuck out. They were all, every single act was incredible. I didn't have, I, I walked away from it. I brought my family, my whole family. My daughter asked me what was my favorite, and I couldn't come up with one because they were all so brilliant. And the the amount of energy and um, and effort that goes into that production, uh, they should all be commended. It was fabulous. Um, I also attended the March for Our Schools uh, in support of our teachers. and. Um, also attended a caucus of African American leaders uh, meeting, um, as I generally do. I somehow sometimes I don't mention it, but I try to go almost every month. And this month was particularly wonderful because um, myself and a bunch of other amazing women in our community were um, were honored uh, as part of um, Women's Month. Although I think we should honor women every day. And. Um, I think that's it for the two weeks. It was very, it was very, very busy. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Hummer. Um, yes, it's a busy time of year. Um, I attended um, an the Arts Empowered Grant um, event at Belgrove Elementary School, <laughs> and um, just amazing things that are going on in our northern cluster about the arts and integrating arts in there and we've once again received a massive NEA grant to help in include that and so it was a great experience to be out there. Um, I also attended the March for Our Schools. It was, we marched for all school employees and for our students to come out. I really enjoyed riding the bus with a group of teachers from Maryland City Elementary and being out in part there and, and with the teachers as we um, voiced what you know our support for the Kerwin Commission and additional funding for everyone. Um, 
For the second year in a row, I had the pleasure of attend going to Chesapeake High School for their Read Across America event. Their Jerry Svetik, who's their media specialist, is phenomenal, and she puts on a great event every year where she brings in authors all day long to meet with the students and talk to them about writing and the importance. And I always come away with a new stack of books to read, and that was a great event to have. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. Antwine and I um, and Ms. Urea all attended the STEM Awards ceremony um, last week um, as we honored two the, the top student two outstanding STEM students from every one of our high school programs. And as as the MC so rightly said, we all came away feeling a bit inadequate because these students are so amazingly accomplished in doing such great things and have such great ambitions coming out there. Um, this weekend. It was incredibly exciting. Two of our high schools, the girls and the boys basketball teams, went to the state finals. So I went to old, I went up to Towson to watch Old Mill play, and then I went down to um, College Park to watch the Broadneck boys. Unfortunately, neither one pulled it out, but they had amazing seasons to get to the finals, so that was incredibly exciting. So um, hats off to both of those basketball programs for the, what they had. Um, Today I went to Solly Elementary to judge the science fair, which is always exciting to look at the science fair and for me to be grateful that none of mine had to do one this year. And I was glad for that, so I was happy to judge others. But, and the, one of the best things that I've done in these past two weeks is that um, Monday I attended through the Maryland Association of Boards of Education, their Equity Academy. And I attended that along with several staff members um, from AACPS as we talked about um, creating a equity an equity policy for our school districts and um, the importance of looking at every decision we make through an equity lens to make sure that we are providing the resources that children need to succeed not equal resources but what everyone needs and that and going through the equity lens of how we do that AACPS is um, has already is already doing that when we go through all of our policies and programs but it was a wonderful refresher and to use the tool and talking with other school districts from around the state um, as to do that and so um, I'm looking forward to what we're going to bring from that move forward and I um, encourage and hope my fellow board members for future um, of these boards academy on equity will attend as well they're going to have more of them coming out there because it's such a valuable tool and it's so crucial for meeting all the needs of our students and rose has already left but i do want to just throw out there that it's not every day you get to meet one of your heroes and so meeting rosa today was um and and recognizing her was was huge and I'm so grateful for her family's work and Senator Mikulski and um, Delegate Sophocles who was a champion for families um, and children with special needs throughout his time in the delegation so um, that was a wonderful thing to have today thank you thank you Mr. Rea thank you um, so as many of my other fellow board members have reiterated uh, we've gone to a lot of events recently so one that I was privileged to go to was the Arts Empowerment Minds grant announcement at Belgrove Elementary School um, it was actually my first time over there it was a beautiful school but it was amazing just getting to see how these fourth graders and fifth graders like knew all these body movements and like correlated it to education it was really inspiring um, something else I got to go to was the TAC March um, on the 11th so it was great with other smobs and TAC members and people from around the county um, and Maryland coming together in downtown Annapolis and on a county um, just to really fight for education and funding um, and then something else I got to go to um, with Miss Hummer and Miss Antoine as well was the STEM awards ceremony um, at st. John's College um, and it was really amazing because it was really signifying the excellence and um, in education and STEM of our students but then they got to really give back to their teachers as well and signify how they were so successful and passionate about something because of their teachers and how they were inspired by them. So there were a lot of tears, but it was really fantastic. And that, that was by far one of the best ceremonies I've ever been to. Um, and then something that I actually did today with a couple other crafts kids was, um, as I told you last month, uh, we paired up with curriculum and we're looking at the implicit bias in elementary school books. So we just had our second meeting of our series today, right before the Board of Education meeting. And so we each got assigned a book to read and it's really awesome. I am so excited to read a book. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> no, it's I'm really excited to look through this book and analyze the my, from my perspective, um, my background, just see how I interpret my emotions when reading this book to maybe change the um, 
the lesson plans or just really look at it from a different lens. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity and Krask is really excited too. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rea. And I would be remiss if I, I did not say um, Ms. Mrs. Antwine is at um, the county executive's budget hearing uh, tonight uh, in District 1, and she should be joining us momentarily. Uh, but if she was here with us, uh, I know she would draw attention as well to the um, 2019 AACPS County Regional Science and Engineering Expo Award. She and I had the, the privilege of, of being there last week and uh, being on stage to um, shake, uh, I want to say, uh, about 200 hands um, uh, throughout the evening. It felt like being at a, a graduation, a, a early indication of what's to come later. Uh, but that was just a great event. And I know she would have uh, mentioned that if she was here tonight. Uh, but she should be joining us uh, very soon. Um, item 2.07, superintendent's update. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, I, I want to thank the board members. I won't be repetitive of all the things that I got a chance to attend along with many of the board members in the last several weeks. Um, but I do want to thank you for getting out there, getting out there to the, the plays and the science fairs and reading in schools and whatever it might be. It's really important that our, our children and our staff and our community see you out in schools. And so I'm delighted for that. So thank you. Um, three things I just want to mention. One is that we um, uh, are, um, are, are Financial reporting here in Anne Arundel County has won yet again another award. Um, the Association of Business Officials International, or ASBO, um, has awarded Anne Arundel County yet um, another outstanding financial reporting award. Um, I was recently contacted by ASBO, and um, uh, they stated that they are pleased to award Anne Arundel County with a Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting. ASBO International's COE recognizes districts that have met the program's high standards for financial reporting and accountability. The school district earned the Certificate of Excellence for its comprehensive annual financial report, or the, known as the CAFR, um, for the fiscal year ending in 2018. And so I thank the team. They are amazing. It's not the first time, and it certainly won't be the last time the work is amazing. So thank you to Matt and your team. Um, and it really speaks well to uh, one of our driving values in that sound stewardship in our strategic plan. So thank you to you. Thank you to the team. Uh, it has been uh, reported in the news recently, Channel 13 and others, that we have just launched the new STAR program, or Screening Teens to Access Recovery. Um, it's a partnership with Anne Arundel County Department of Health where our school nurses are now trained and equipped to connect students to licensed mental health therapists who are seeking assistance with substance abuse issues. And that can be done right in school in the health rooms. Um, it's just another way that we're working to positively influence the social emotional growth and well-being of our students. I thank very much um, Karen Siska and the nursing group. I know that um, uh, Ms. Egan and your team have worked very hard with them to put this together. Uh, but this was recently launched and we have had um, our first student log in um, uh, in this past week um, and gotten services and, and helped them. So we're delighted that it's up and running. So thank you to your and team and thank you to the partnership with the County Department of Health. And lastly, I got the opportunity today um, to spend a brief a bit of time at Cat South. If you weren't aware, we compete um, each year in the um, Cyber Patriot competition, which is done nationally. Cat South Cyber Patriot team, which are member, which uh, the members are comprised of uh, students, um, both 11th and 12th graders that are in the uh, Cisco Systems program. Um, they won third place platinum in the state of Maryland. They are the first public school to win that high award. They placed 21st in the country out of 3,293 teams in the open division. So you ask the question, what is the Cyber Patriot competition? And so I had to print it up because if I try to explain it to you, I would just butcher it. So in short, um, uh, it is the goal of the Cyber Patriot competition to find and fix vulnerabilities 
in operating systems. And so the teams are giving these, given these imaginary operating systems where they have to log in and go through a time period where they have to keep them up and running as vulnerabilities are coming in and it's under attack through cyber, um, if that makes sense to those of you that are much smarter than me. Um, some rounds include networking challenges in the form of quizzes and um, uh, and Cisco pa uh, packet tracer activities. Teams can also gain points by answering questions about their actions. When teams fix a vulnerability that is being checked, they receive points. If they take an action that makes the system less secure, they lose points. And so this is, um, uh, so uh, members of the MSDE, the state board, uh, were down to award the uh, certificates to the students. And so we're really proud of that work. So go Cyber Patriot team at Cat South, the first in the state of Maryland to win platinum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arlotto. Uh, we are now at item 2.08, which is policy committee update. Mrs. Corkadal. Thank you, Mr. Gilliland. So the uh, policy committee met on March the 13th at 1 p.m. Um, here in this building, and uh, uh, we reviewed regulation DJ-RA on grants, many grants, and special projects, um, and made commentary to it. Uh, we also opened a new discussion on policy IFF of special education, which is ongoing. Um, with no current action and uh, policy II of grading, um, which will be moving forward to this board. Um, any questions for policy committee? No? Thank uh, you. Seeing none, we're done. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, my apologies, sir. Uh, the next meeting will be on, Oh boy. April 10th. April 10th, thank you. <laughs> At 1 p.m. and it is open for uh, the public to observe. Excellent, thank you so much for, for that update. Item 2.09 is the CRASC report. Good evening, President Gilliland, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. My name is Savannah Quick. I attend Northeast High School, and I am Secretary of Education for CRASC. Tomorrow, we will be holding our final middle school leadership event at George Fox Middle School, titled Building Middle School Leaders. Students will be participating in sessions focused on event planning, fundraising, kindness, and advocacy. Students will also take part in an opening activity on the topic of bullying prevention. In addition, the students will have the opportunity to, to interact with our three SMOB finalists announced this week. I'm very excited to return to my former school. Crask would like to congratulate our three SMOB finalists, Rita Alvey from Annapolis High School, Tyler Bailey from South River High School, and Charmi Patel from South River High School. On April 4th, Crask will host a televised debate between the candidates beginning at 6.30 p.m. The debate will be student moderated and will be based on a format to be determined by CRASC. It will be located in this room. SMOB elections will be held on April 11th. All middle and high school de delegations will be invited to attend. The candidate with the highest number of votes will have his or her name forwarded to the governor for appointment. A delegation of students will be attending the Maryland Association of Student Councils Convention in Ocean City from March 27th to March 29th. The theme for this year's conference is Keys to Leadership. We look forward to connecting with student leaders from all over the state. Finally, we have counted the ballots and are pleased to announce that our CRAS constitution and platform have been ratified. These documents can be found on our website, www.aacps.org slash CRASC. Just click the doc on the documents on the, the documents tab on the left. Good luck to everyone taking quarterlies. I appreciate the time to give you a quick update about what's happening in Crask. Thank you. Savannah, before you leave, yes. uh, Mrs. Hummer. I just want to give Savannah a shout out when we went to STEM Awards last week. She is the first place STEM Award winner from Northeast High School. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, item 2.10 is the PTA report.
Good evening, Dr. Arlotto. Good evening, board members. My name is Vanessa Rivera, and I'm with Anne Arundel County Castle PTA. So I am happy to announce that for 2018-2019, the county council has awarded the PTA scholarships. The recipients are Allison Omer and Sophia Dutton. The Phoebe Apperson Hart Scholarship is awarded to the high school graduate who is planning a career in any subject other than education. This year, as I said, is awarded to Sophia Dunn from Severna Park High School. Um, she will per be pursuing a degree in neuroscience. The Kenneth Lawson Scholarship is awarded to the high school graduate who is pursuing a degree in the field of education. So we're very excited about that. Um, as I stated, the recipient is Allison Omer. Again, she is from Severna Park High School. She will be attending Salisbury University in this year. Um, I would also like to take the opportunity to talk to you about our upcoming event um, scheduled for April 8th. Anne Arundel County Council PTA will be hosting its annual Founders Day celebration. The Founders Day banquet allows us to congratulate our dedicated volunteers and partners for their hard work on behalf of the county. This event will be taking place at La Fountain Blue at 630. Um, more information can be found on our website aaccpta.org. Thank you. Thank you. And I was going to compliment your glasses, but then I realized I'd have to compliment Mr. Leone for his as well. Yes. So, thank you. <laughs> and we did not plan it. Thank you. Thank you. And earlier, I, I uh, uh, did not recognize, uh, but one of our, our former colleagues and good friends is here, uh, Councilwoman Allison Pickard. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, item. 2.11 uh, is a special presentation, uh, Service Learning, Making a Difference for Children and Communities. Dr. McMahon and friends. Good evening. My name is Mary Talar and I'm the proud Assistant Superintendent for Advanced Studies and Programs. It is my honor to be with you this evening to discuss our service learning program. As we agree, greatness is determined by service. To begin, I would like my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Good evening, I'm Lori Fowler, and I am the Signature Program Facilitator at Glen Burnie High School. Hello, I'm Ronnie Cox, a junior at Glen Burnie High School. Hello, I'm Anaya Thompson, a sophomore at Glen Burnie High School. In 1997, Maryland was the first state in the nation to require all state high school students to engage in service learning as part of their high school graduation requirements. Service learning is a teaching method that combines meaningful service to the community with curriculum-based learning. Students improve their academic skills by applying what they learn in class to real-world issues. They then reflect on their experience to reinforce the link between their service and their learning. As such, Maryland service learning requires all local school systems to ensure learning plans include preparation, action, and reflection in consideration of best practices. Maryland's best practices consist of addressing a recognized need in the community, achieving curricular objectives through service learning, reflecting throughout the service learning experience, developing student responsibility, establishing community partnerships, planning ahead for service learning, and equipping students with knowledge and skills needed for civic engagement. In the spirit of the county's strategic plan, we believe Service learning promotes opportunity, academic growth, and personal and community development. We also believe service learning is a teaching and learning strategy that integrates meaningful engagement with instruction and reflection to enrich the learning experiences of our students while teaching civic responsibility and strengthening our communities. The ultimate goal of our service learning program is to help students become an integral part of their civic surroundings while also helping them understand and appreciate their role of service in a democratic society. Our program begins in fifth grade and concludes in high school through discipline explorations. Specifically, student service learning experiences are primarily integrated into the curriculum in the following grades and courses. Five interdisciplinary hours in fifth grade, 30 interdisciplinary hours, 10 in each of the three grades in middle school, 40 hours in high school with 10 hours in US government, health, English, and science, However, we realized we could and should do so much more. So we have designed a service learning portal. The creation of the online service learning portal modeled after our internship portal was purposeful. Anne Arundel County Public Schools believes in the benefits of service learning and the role of stewardship in our students. 
This portal enhances the student role in citizenship while reinforcing the intangible benefits to our youth in developing self-confidence, following passions, building greater global community awareness, and seeing the impact of social responsibility. Serve AACPS, our brand new service learning portal, is an interactive web platform that now provides high school students with options for service learning opportunities all over our county. It is moving us from low end public service experiences to high end student choice and community based service opportunities for learning and character growth. Although our ultimate goal is to integrate the portal option into the 75 hours of required service learning, today I am so excited to share the first stage of the portal is actually being piloted in every single one of our high schools through a distinguished service learning context. Lori's going to discuss it more. AACPS in initiated the Distinguished Service Learning Portal pilot for all high schools in the fall of 2018. As reflected in the Ready, Set, Launch indicator of the strategic plan, it's our goal to prepare all students for college, career, and community readiness. Being change makers with action is a key tenant as our students move from high school to adult, engaging in transitional pursuits. This year, beyond earning 75 hours, many of our high school students are going above and beyond working with established clubs and established community get partners on service learning initiatives. In fact, 126 projects are in the process or completed as of today. This includes over 43 opportunities across the district. Within the portal, each student has his or her own dashboard, which displays information about the hours engaged, current projects, and completed opportunities. From this page, the students can access new projects, recommend a community partner, print the service resume for Navian's inclusion, and update agreements or personal information. Additionally, in the spirit of collaboration, each of our partners has an individual dashboard. This page allows the partner to update agreements, indicate interest in other partnership opportunities, view current and past service opportunities, access resources, and create new opportunities for our students. Over the past two years, county students have participated in service events in the portal. They have included opportunities at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, CERC, Centro de Ayuda, Rotary Bountiful Backpacks, and Walk the Walk Foundation. A recent Southern graduate, Joey Miller, currently attends Salisbury University. His experience working with CERC led him to an internship there. In his class at Salisbury last semester, a photo from CERC came on the screen. Joey instantly identified it and then elaborated on the project like the expert that he is. His professor wondered how he recognized and knew so much. He relayed his story of service. She noted how insightful he was and was genuinely impressed that he did all of that in high school. The opportunity was perfect for Joey. He was able to help the environment, add his passion for the outdoors, and work with his hands to make an impact. Not just an impact at CERT, but an impact on his own learning. Utilizing a dashboard framework, site administrators are able to navigate the entire portal. There they can mass email partners, add teachers and club advisors, access student information as needed, approve projects, and view upcoming opportunities. Teacher and club advisors have similar capabilities, but they're limited to only the students within their school or their club. The impact of serving and the portal is best described by our student voices. Ronnie Cox, a junior, and Anaya Thompson, a sophomore, attend Glen Burnie High School. They've been using the portal this year, and now they will share some of their experiences and how the portal has helped them in serving their community today and in the future. Um, good evening. I'm very happy to be here tonight to share my experiences with the service portal. Oh, sorry. So far, I have served with the Anne County Public Library, Anne Arundel County CERT, and Anne Arundel County Homeless Resource Day. I would like to briefly highlight my experiences with the Homeless Resource Day. The event provided help for those who needed it. I helped a lady who was in a wheelchair and was dealing with COPD. This event provided help for the... Oh. <laughs> We went around and I was able to help her get medical attention, like dental, and set up other appointments. The event also provided help getting IDs and financial help. As a result of this, I now realize that our county offers so many resources for those experiencing homelessness and that even we even have families in our community who are homeless. I also learned how to operate a wheelchair, which is um, something I've never done. <laughs> I was glad I could serve this day, and now I look forward 
to finding other opportunities in the portal to get involved in ways to support our community. Now, Anaya will share ways she believes the portal will help in the future. Thank you, Ronnie. When I first heard about the portal, I thought it was exciting because we don't really hear much about volunteering except in our signature class. I believed it would provide a neat way for us to get involved in our community. I also like how it is so easily accessible. Usually when I think of volunteering, I think of having to look around online and find something to do. But with the portal, it makes it really easy and even provides categories for the opportunity to find things that fit my passion. I think that the portal will allow me to humble myself more because when you are volunteering, it allows you to sympathize with people who are different than you. It makes you appreciate things you have. It will also help me work, help me with work and social opportunities. I am not really the speaker type of person, and these opportunities allow me to develop leadership and speaking skills. It will also help prepare me long term for my college and career decisions. When it comes down to it, the opportunities on the portal allow students to feel good about being part of making a change for someone in a positive way. This concludes our presentation. We thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening. At this time, we'd like to leave you with a quote on the screen, and we are prepared to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much for this presentation. And Anaya, for somebody who doesn't like speaking, you fooled all of us. So uh, you did a great job. And Ronnie, thank you as well. Uh, we've got a couple of questions here. Mrs. Shawheim. Thank you all for being here. I don't really um, have a question. I just, I just think this is fabulous. So I wanted to throw that out there. And thank you so much for serving um, your community. And it was wonderful hearing about your experiences. I'm a lifelong volunteer myself since I was 11, and this is personal and meaningful, and I, I'm so glad that we do this and, and, um, and expect this of our students. And so thank you for a wonderful job. Mr. Rea. I also want to echo what Ms. Shaham said, and thank you all so much for the presentation and coming and speaking about this portal. Um, it's really inspiring hearing what you guys do in the community and volunteering, just hearing how it humbles you and opens your eyes to many more possibilities. Um, I just do have a couple of questions. Um, so my first question is, so you explained how this portal, for example, allows students to add more hours. Um, now, does that account? So does that, that pretty much add to their hours that are required to the community or by the school system, I mean? Or does that supplement hours? So at this point, it's adding to the 75 hours that are built into the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But you are absolutely reading where we want to go. We actually mm -hmm. want the portal to be used to facilitate choice. Mm -hmm. So right now, through the different explorations of the courses and or the interdisciplinary connections that happen in fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth grade, it's grade level oriented. Okay. How wonderful would it be through a connection of learning that children could actually have a choice yeah. to actually show how they can make a difference staying within mm -hmm. the learning connection, but actually uh, giving back not just in the school day, but beyond the school day to count for the 75. So that is our goal to get there. Okay. We're just starting with distinguished at this time as we're building that. Yeah. And thank you. My follow-up question is, so would it what you envision, is it essentially for example, like internship coordinator, but it would be like a service project coordinator, or is it just one teacher at a school that would be assigned to checking off their programs? So our goal would be that teachers give choice within the okay. curriculum opportunities of exploration, mm -hmm. so that they would actually work with the community to establish um, service connections within their communities at large, mm -hmm. so that a child could select to do the service through that medium, or also continue to work yeah. within the curricular itself. But we really mm -hmm. want to um, have children have a a personal connection to their mm -hmm. learning and see how they can make a difference as a steward or a change maker um, as part of their learning career. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's This is amazing, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Corkadell. Um, I, I want to echo um, appreciation for, for launching this. So you mentioned, um, Ronnie, the, the, uh, uh, about Homeless Resource Day. And so just to say out loud a little bit more about that, because I've, I've participated in it um, several years in a row, and um, it is so amazing. And so for you to participate in that, uh, like, the amount of people that they serve are by the hundreds. 
um, every homeless person in Anne Arundel County is is counted and counted for and ends up appearing there and the services that are provided are so so valuable to them without those services they are, they don't have the ability to connect and to survive in some cases so it, al although you had a little you played a small role in it um, I just want to say out loud how big of a, of a difference that makes because that's how we get people from being homeless to having stable housing and to having a stable life and so you may not recognize it but you probably saved a life that day because that is what happens every single homeless resource day so I just wanted to say that and I do concur with our president you are so well spoken and I hope you continue to build into that and that and and lose some of that fear because you have a lot of powerful words to say and you say them all so well mrs. Hummer um, yes so you said that we're now put this out there to all the high schools is it available to all students or are we piloting groups of students at the high school right now for us? so it was sent out through signature facilitators okay. and then with with that at each school kind of going into the clubs so at Glen Burnie High School we've been working with um, some of the BEMA students some of the AVID students um, interact is involved in it so we're just kind of making sure that it, everything's going well and then hopefully you know within the next year it can be open to anyone but anyone can really get on it it's just a matter of them accessing it and then making sure that they came to a signature facilitator or one of the club sponsors who could make sure that we have the agreements from the parents um, ready and, and on okay. hand so purposeful training happened with all the signature facilitators at the beginning of the school year and we asked for every school to start tinkering as we were ensuring that the portal itself um, is being responsive to our needs as well as building the community partnerships um, so our goal really is to have it a school-wide opportunity but I think even just and we were talking about upstairs we have students that have recognized the value of the portal and because of the experience that they've had in their school they're independently searching and then a sponsor at the school will then support them with their journey based on the opportunities that have been extended to them so we're excited about that so it's not just school or club oriented it's actually independent uh, future leaders um, are looking to get back in some way so it's exciting to see that as well but our goal really is to have it um, the wealth of the usage in high school and then moving it into the 75 credits as well that's our goal and it really is something that's going to have to spread like the good things that are happening on, happening on the portal like with Ronnie and Anaya going to their friends and saying hey there's some really good activities on here opportunities for you get involved and so anything you know positive like that it's going to spread and the students are going to start seeing the opportunities as things that they should be involved with that's great well I think it sounds wonderful and I do want to give a shout out y'all are in the signature program at Glen Burnie and what is the title of the signature program um. Public service. service. Public service. Yeah. So y'all were the perfect example for this today. I just wanted to, to give that shout out to Glenn Burney and the great work the signature program is doing there and the kids in it. Thank yeah. you. Mrs. Ellis. Hi, thank you so much for doing this and um, it's a great presentation and thank both of you for your service. Um, so you sort of answered my questions. Um, Ms. Hummer asked my questions, but um, I guess I want to understand a little better because I being the parent of teens I have kids going to college every other year for what feels like forever but um, so I'm familiar with the college preparation process and um, when when I was helping my daughter through it because you know she would come bounce things off me and um, she had to rack her brain and go back and she there are so many things she, I forgot I did that you know and she's so um, this is a great tool for that so I guess my question so to make sure I understand it correctly any student who wants the opportunity to use it that way can seek that out now yes for every student on their dashboard they have an um, option where they can print their resume and that will include their hours who they worked with um, what they did and then the contact for that person so if they had to get some kind of a, an, a you know a recommendation or something for college it's all easily accessible and that's one of the you know the big selling points of it is and because it, yes as, as we do we rel relate it to our own I said you know my child had to do his applications he had yeah, rack his brain like where did I go what did I do well now it's going to be all on hand for them so that definitely is one of the you know better things about it it will allow them to have easy access to that and we're linking to the Naviance program so it builds their portfolio yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay. And it is open to every high school student at this time. It, sorry? It, it is open to every high school student at this time. Okay, that was, I just want to be clear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Um, and I, I have no more lights here, so just to, again to say thank you to all of you. And, and Ronnie, I, I serve on the board of a local nonprofit called Hope for All that, that supports the transition from homelessness to self sustainability. Uh, so, this is an issue that's near and dear to me. So, thank you for, for doing what you do. And, and to both of you, um, I'm going to say something that I've never said before. Uh, I'm a graduate of North County High School. I'm a proud knight, but for both of you, I'm going to say go Gophers. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you. And now we will move to the public comment portion of our agenda. Anyone wishing to speak on an item not on today's agenda may offer testimony during this public comment portion of the meeting. Speakers are allotted three minutes each and may not allocate their time to others. A tone will sound when time has expired. The board asks that comments remain civil and appropriate for the various audiences that may be watching or viewing this meeting. Student specific and personnel matters are confidential and cannot be discussed in this forum. It is not the board's general practice to engage in question and answer session with speakers. For the record, please give your name before speaking. Handouts should be given to the board assistant. We have six seats and, and a podium, and um, we have um, five cards, so everyone can come up. Carla Simons, Romeo Simons, Jennifer Sowers, Russell Leone, and Corinne Frank. Start. Whoever you guys want to start. My name is Carla Simons. Good evening, board members and Dr. Arlotto. My husband and I have a blended active duty armed forces family with three teenage sons living in the Broadneck feeder section. Our two oldest sons are half black and half white, one of whom has an autism diagnosis with severe speech language disorder. Our youngest son is white. Before transferring to Maryland, I homeschooled our sons for several years. I needed to work on my own health. We were told that the Brognet schools were top notch and had a phenomenal special needs program. Instead, the exact opposite was true. Our oldest son has been a victim of racial profiling several times at Brognet High School. During one instance, he was falsely accused of stealing money from another student's backpack. During the investigation, he was berated by one of the assistant principals who was also threatening my husband. When the video of the incident was reviewed, it clearly showed my son taking crackers, which the other student was fine with, out of his backpack and sitting there eating them calmly. Our son got two days suspension, the principal did nothing, and it was also kept on his record through half of the next year. Additionally, two months ago, same son went to the school nurse as he was horribly sick. Instead of treating him like any of the other Caucasian students in the health room, the school nurse falsely accused him of being under the influence of drugs. She kept making this accusation even after my husband told her three times our son was not on drugs. He did in fact have a stomach virus and I had to file a complaint. Our youngest son was tormented and harassed for months by other students with no relief. He was finally so frustrated that he lashed out at the offenders calling them the meanest thing he could think of, the N-word. He got two day suspension and had to take bias classes. The other students walked away undisciplined. The principal handling this bias towards him even told my husband that this is a man's world and women are second class in a meeting that we had with her over this mess. Our special needs son has been the target of theft and assault at Broadneck High School. In January 2017, his wallet was stolen in gym class taking his lunch money. Nothing was done. Two weeks later, he was attacked by another special needs student, which drew blood. There was no phone call home, no incident report, and he wasn't even taken to the nurse's office. The only remedy that was offered was to keep the two students apart. 
Administration took our son out of his normal classes, rotating him out of guitar, gym, walking, and nutrition to let this other student graduate. How is this providing an equitable learning environment for my son? During this time, the IEP established with AACPS was found to be ineffective and useless. I requested that a parent educator from Parents Place of Maryland review it, and we discovered that it was never met with SMART goals. During his homeschooling in 2016, I had prepared him for fourth, fifth grade academics. School assessments showed that instead of advancing my son, AACPS had regressed him by two academic years since enrollment. After this, our son was retaliated against by two varsity cheerleaders who harassed and taunted him. After filing a bullying report, the girls lied on their statements, causing no resolution yet again. The principals and staff did nothing positive, instead hid, lied, and destroyed any possibility for him to graduate from Broadneck High School. I sent multiple emails to all of them, including Dr. Arlotto, Senator Riley, OCR, OSER, and to my cousin, who is Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Education. Where is the accountability for administration? What has happened to every child's right to free and appropriate education in a safe learning environment? How will you as a board address the bias, racism, bullying, and harassment that is plaguing our schools? Thank you. My name is Romeo Simons. I'm 18 years old and I currently attend Broadneck High School. I've lived here in Maryland for the past three years. I came from a school where I was bullied what seemed like every day for anything people could pick at me with. It could have been anything from my hair to people making fun of my brother. I was hoping that by moving to Maryland I could have a new start and focus on my education. Instead I was faced with a new situation and discrimination. It first started my sophomore year in the second semester. I was sitting in lunch with a friend of mine. At that moment I was not aware that another student that we knew was stealing money from someone else in the lunchroom. I walked over to that same student's backpack and took some crackers that he had in his lunchbox, came back to the table and proceeded to eat them. My friend and the student taking the money came back to the table that I was at. An administrator came over and told the boy who stole the money to give it back. When she came over, the bell rang for us to go back to class. I was called down to the office and was immediately met with accusations of stealing money. The administrator who was holding me in her office threatened to have my father investigated by her daughter from Fort Meade and threatened to have me arrested if I did not give her my money. She told me that the student who was robbed was missing $200, but when it come to find out, it was only $120. The school officials already had the money in their possession, but still threatened me and my friend to give them our money. They would not allow me to watch the footage that they took in the lunchroom, but said that they had me on camera going through the student's bag and stealing money. When my parents came down to the school, the administrator changed up her whole personality and tried to deny everything that she threatened me with. Once we were shown the footage, it showed that all I took from the bag was indeed crackers. I was still suspended two days for stealing crackers. I was told by the principal that if I stayed out of trouble until the end of the first semester of my junior year, that they would remove the incident from my record. When I came to him telling him that I fulfilled my promise, he told me that he didn't know what I was talking about. My second incident was when I was in school and I was looking for a room with a computer to complete my homework. I went to the library, but when I got there, an administrator would not let me in. She waited until the bell rang to come over to the door and tell, that I, tell me that I was late when I had arrived on time. I was told to go to the tardy room with a friend who was with me. The room had a group full of black girls and some Latinos. She wrote us up and gave us a speech about how we cannot come to the tardy room if we don't have a classroom. No sooner than she said that, a group of white boys came in and asked if they could sit in here because they had no room to go to and she'd allowed it with no referrals for them. I've also had a teacher put items such as erasers and pencils in my hair during class after I told him not to on multiple occasions. My brother, who also has autism, has dealt with issues also. His freshman year, someone stole his wallet from the locker room and the school would not investigate. This past year, a couple cheerleaders were taunting him at a football game. Administrators would not do anything about it. I confronted both cheerleaders on the issue and they filed police reports on me, to which the school decided it was worth their time looking into. Once they talked to the cheerleaders, every single cheerleader who was pulled into the office lied about the situation and were faced with no repercussions. Other students around the school used the term autistic as a derogatory statement to use against him, to which I stuck up for him in those situations. I believe that the Board of Education should enforce accountability for school administrators and personnel and create a safer environment for learning. Also, I missed some work for this meeting, so could you please write me an excuse to handle my boss? Thank you. Good evening, uh, board members and Dr. Arlotto. My name is Jennifer Sowers, and I am with the Anne Arundel County Parent Coalition. 
Tonight, I represent over 800 concerned parents throughout our county. Over the past three years, our coalition has advocated for improved school policies, transparency, communication, and safer school environments. We have attended countless meetings with administrators, teachers, and staff, and have heard from scores of parents with gut-wrenching stories involving their children. It is imperative that every dollar spent and every resource deployed in our county is done in the most efficient and productive way possible. Now, with that said, I'm not familiar with the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting, but I was made aware that you guys have just had an audit um, by the state legislature. And I am, uh, I'm gonna request that a full audit be done by an independent agency, because when I pull up the information from the last audit in 2014, um, it says that, uh, that AACPS needs to improve internal controls, that there were issues with properly securing networks with critical data files, such as those containing student information, that information was used from the internal auditors for AACPS instead of it being independent. So I just wanna throw that in there. Um, so as far as the audit goes, I am asking for financials, waste, and mental health resources. Is every dollar being used effectively? Are contractors completing work that they are being paid to do? Are our schools being maintained properly? Are there better ways to structure our mental health resources and utilize crisis response in a more proactive way? With over half of the county's budget at stake going to our schools, it is urgent that officials understand how great the need is. Additionally, we are requesting the following. Number one, in the current practice of using internal school in incident reports instead of the online bullying report, this practice directly affects critical data that is used to determine what resources our children receive. Number two, currently school principals and some administrators enjoy an enormous amount of autonomy. We ask that you as the Board of Education establish a stringent set of guidelines for all schools across the county to adhere to, such as every school should receive the same suicide awareness resources. Every school should follow the same communication protocols. Every school should cooperate with crisis response on proactive efforts to address our me mental health crisis. Leadership is everything. Number three, evaluate the current placement practices regarding juvenile services and adjustment transfers by administrators into the student general population as well as into any special education programs. Currently, these students show up at schools with no files to guide staff on where to place them or if there are offenses involved that could jeopardize other students' safety. Can I go on? Okay. Um, let's see. Lastly, we ask that each of you take the time to review the reports that I emailed you this afternoon. They include the most recent youth suicide report, Resolution 818, that was passed by County Council last year, a schematic of the issues that our coalition has identified over the past few years, Title IX guidelines, FERPA, which is the privacy laws, and last year's bullying, harassment, and intimidation report to the General Assembly. Um, we are in a state of emergency for our children and their mental health. With all of this information av available to you all, we look to each of you to take action now. Thank you and I appreciate your time. I will email the rest of it to each of you. I only had two more points. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Corinne Frank. I'm the PTA president at Badkin Elementary School. Um, many parents have uh, come here to speak from our cluster tonight. Um, actually, some of them aren't speaking, but they're here. And uh, there are a lot of issues that affect our county and many of them are unique to our little peninsula. Last night, the crisis response team came to CHS to give a presentation on mental health and the support offered by the county. I know most of the people who I've spoken with um, inside the school system and in our local government support mental health initiatives. And I also know that many of the board members support those initiatives as well and voted in the most recent budget for some support um, further than what we usually do. So I appreciate that. Um, I, as a parent, would just urge you to keep this concern at the forefront of the work of this body. And I love the STAR program. I think that's a great idea. I think that's a fantastic initiative. And I thank you for your work and concern in that regard. 
I have also come to this board on a few occasions now to ask for more playtime for our young students. In the Bodkin School District especially, our children do not get home until 4.30, and for many months of the year, they do not have the option for outside play once they are home. In a recent article that I read, Peter Gray, PhD professor of psychology at Boston College, states that he believes generational increases in externality, extrinsic goals, anxiety, and depression are all caused largely by the decline over that same period in opportunities for free play and the increased time and weight given to schooling. We see the rise of depression. We see the decline of playtime. They may not be unrelated. What we're asking is for students to simply be allowed to be children and play. I am also here tonight in regards to the positive lead testing in the water of CBMS. In one of the four consumable outlets, it was a locker room fountain, there was almost 20 times the acceptable level of lead. We were promised two years ago that our water did not have lead in it by this body, and we were assured that it was tested several times per week. Martell did the testing then, Martell did the testing now. Um, it was the same group uh, who released both results. Parents from High Point Elementary School also reached out recently because they had 13 consumable outlets that tested positive. As they are not able to attend tonight, they asked me to have the bottled water policy in that school clarified for parents. As of right now, those parents are under the impression that their children are not allowed to bring bottled water because whatever policy is in place, so they are asking to have that clarified and that policy addressed if that's the case. I would like to reach out um, and request a meeting with someone who would be able to explain all of these discrepancies on all of these issues and to discover whether or not our children were exposed to lead leading up to the installation of the bottled water in our school system and to clarify the bottled water policies in all school systems. I will email you um, tomorrow to request that. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Leone, uh, just one moment, please. Uh, Mrs. Shaw. Um, just because I'm unaware, uh, what is the current bottled water policy and what schools does it apply to? Is it well water schools or is it well water and city water schools? And wh what is the current? I know it was, it was, something was suspended while we were doing the testing, like students who couldn't previously bring a water bottle from home could now, could, is that still in place? Yes. These are also for you. Students are absolutely welcome to bring water bottles to school. Okay, now what about the bottled water? Is there any sort of bottled water policy and, and how, approximately how many schools does it? I'm, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Okay, so are there schools where instead of having outlets available for consumable purposes, is bottled water supplied, right? At, at the Chesapeake School. At the Chesapeake Cluster, we do have bottled water. Okay, yes. so, but you want to know if other schools would... Two parents from High Point Elementary, which is close by, Got have it. asked because they knew I was attending tonight. They do not have bottled water to the best of my ability, but they're bringing bottles, and they were not, they were under the impression that they were not allowed to bring the bottles. Oh. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, and they asked me if it wasn't a policy to please ask for for that to be changed. We'll follow up with High Point, thanks. of course. All right, thanks. Oh, thank you. So good evening, President Gilliland, Vice President Urea, Dr. Alato, members of the board. My name is Russell Leone. I'm the president of the Teachers Association. So first of all, you might have heard of our little march, the March for Our Schools that happened last week. And I want to thank the board members that were able to attend and those that supported it. Um, I did see some of you. I'm kind of glad I didn't run into all of you because it was so well attended. 8,000 was the estimate. Um, all, all educators, support professionals, um, parents, community members, all standing up for our students in our schools and asking that the state provide adequate funding so we can provide those good programs. Tonight, I also want to highlight some of our, our teachers in our county. Um, there are some great things going on, and I know you guys all do your community highlights. Um, in the past couple of weeks, I've also had an opportunity to get out and actually see some of our teachers um, doing what they do best. And so first, I want to um, highlight Mrs. Becky Huber um, from Point Pleasant Elementary. Uh, she teaches pre-K, and I got to go in and volunteer with her pre-K students, and it was really amazing to see the avid um, 
strategies that they're using even in pre-kindergarten. They're doing one-pagers and they're incorporating science. And you know, so I got to sit with groups of students in Mrs. Huber's class and work on these one-pagers. Um, and they're working on their, their letter sounds and, and, and everything. I did one-pagers with my fifth graders and my fourth graders. I never even imagined that pre-kindergarten would be doing that. So this is pretty incredible stuff. Um, I also want to highlight Mrs. Carol Co Ms. Carol Cox, who's at Bodkin Elementary. Um, she's a strings teacher, and she's also mentoring an aspiring educator. So she's out there inspiring and leading our next generation of educators, um, and that's a great thing to see. But one of the, the cool things that I saw with her was the quiet moment in between classes when she would take that individual time with students to get just those right notes out um, and practice that little bit extra. And if you've ever sat with strings, um, they are a constant revolving because they've got a group, they've got like 25 minutes with the group, and then it's like the next group is coming in, and she does that flawlessly. Um, I also want to um, highlight two teachers at Linthicum Elementary School, Ms. Mrs. Holt, who is the Triple E teacher, and Mrs. Ms. Um, Megan Bellerin, who is their PE teacher. Um, the, in the Triple A, each program, she's doing project-based learning. That's pretty cool. They're working on um, currency conversions, um, world trade, and world culture. So it's, it's really helping them to be global citizens and actually create world markets. Um, and in Ms. Bellaren's PE class, they were working on cardio drumming, which was yoga balls, big paint cans, and the rhythm sticks. And I got to jump in with the students, and, and she just led them so well. And I got to see a, a second grade, and then she turns around, and not even two minutes later, she's with fourth grade, doing the same basic skills, but she differentiated it so well for the students. And finally, I want to highlight Mrs. Um, Ms. Allison Hines at Cape St. Clair. Sorry, can I do it real quick? She's fourth grade, and I got to read to her class, but what was inspiring was to be able to stick around and, and watch her mission um, launch, um, her morning mission, and building the community that we know is so important for building relationships. There are fantastic things that are going on in our schools, not just the big presentations, but in these, these everyday moments. And this is why we stand up for our, our teachers, because we want to keep teachers like this. I inspired, motivated, and doing everything they can for our students. So thank you for your time this evening. Mrs. Shaheen. Thank you so much. And I loved hearing about the highlights of the various uh, teachers you were mentioning. So thank you. Just thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll now move to our consent calendar. Um, is there a motion to bundle items 4.01 and 4.02? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, discussion. See none. All in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes aye. have it. We now have a bundled uh, action item. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, sir. I recommend the Board of Education approve contracts as listed on today's agenda 4.01 and 4.02. Is there a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing no board discussion, any public comment? Seeing no public comment. Mrs. Connolly, this is a vote on items 4.01 and 4.02. Would you please call the roll? Beginning with Mr. Live this evening. Mr. Aye. Live? Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Oh. Ms. Corcado? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Scholheim? Aye. Mr. Golan? Aye. That would be seven in the positive, uh, two absences. Thank you. Uh, item 5.01, administrative personnel appointments. Dr. Arlotto, your recommendation, please. Yes, sir. I recommend board approval of the personnel listed on the attached sheet be promoted and or appointed. Sir, motion. So moved. Second. Great. Any board discussion? Seeing none, Mrs. Connolly, would you please call the roll? Mr. Lyde? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Ms. Corcado? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Schoheim? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Uh, seven in the positive, two absences. Motion passes. Thank you. More later, thank you. <laughs> um, <Sorry>. Great. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mrs. Connolly. Um, We'll now move to our second reading calendar, item 5.02, Ms. Ortiz and Mr. Stansky. 
Uh, good evening. For the record, Jeanette Ortiz, Legislative and Policy Council. We have a policy uh, DK, financial fraud, waste, and abuse uh, before you on second reading. There was no public comment received on the proposed uh, revisions to the policy and regulation. However, I did want to point out that um, as a result of uh, recommendations from Mr. Federitz and Board Council, uh, we did add some language on uh, page two of the regulation, uh, the little um, I's, uh, I, I, I. Um, and that basically um, is uh, referencing the Office of Investigations and apprising uh, certain um, offices of the outcomes of investigation. So we did add that last uh, sentence there that would basically ensure that the Office of Investigations apprises the head of any office that was integral to an investigation of the outcome of that investigation, just to make sure that everybody um, is informed and you know all of the loops are closed. Great, thank you so much for that. And we're looking at this on third reading at our first meeting in April. Yes, okay. correct. Great, thank you. Uh, I see no uh, board questions, uh, so is there any public comment? Seeing none, thank you very much. We'll now move to item 5.03, items of legislation. I know um, we, we will have uh, some discussion on some, some other topics momentarily, but um, it looks like we do have one bill that uh, uh, we need to vote on tonight. Yes. Um, Senate Bill 1016. Yes. So I have before you Senate Bill 1016, Education Voluntary Ethical Special Education Advocate Certificate Program. This bill would essentially establish this program. Um, it would be a voluntary program, but it would um, provide for certification by the Maryland State Department of Education to individuals that kind of put themselves out there to be advocates. And it has uh, training and um, an online exam um, and a certification by MSC. And we just thought it was a good idea to have such a program that's moving in the right direction because you may have individuals out there who purport to be advocates or experts in special education but are not and so while this is voluntary it's a step in the right direction we just proposed some amendments to make it even uh, stronger so um, the three amendments were face-to-face -face component to the training clarification on what good moral character would mean um, in order to be eligible for the certification and a mechanism for folks to um, report to MSCE any concerns that they have um, with an individual that was an advocate so the recommendation is to support this uh, legislation with amendments. Excellent. Uh, one question, uh, Mrs. Shaheen. Thank you. Um, so did they get back to you on these clarifications yet or? No, so I have not submitted anything uh, because this requires a board vote. Okay. Um, I have not submitted any recommendations on this uh, legislation. Assuming that it goes Ford, can you um, report back on how they responded to Sure. Things? Thank you. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, so there's been a recommendation by Ms. Ortiz. Is there a motion to um, support this bill with amendments? So moved. Second. Okay, excellent. Um, Mr. Lai. Okay. Um, so we've got a motion and a second. Any other board discussion on this? Uh, any other public comment? Seeing none. Mrs. Connolly, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ellis. <coughs> Both of them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to process it a bit. Um, can you help me understand a little bit about, um, so this would be someone advocating for, say, a child with special needs to the school system? So currently, um, parents uh, with students with uh, special needs, uh, perhaps during an IEP meeting um, or meetings with uh, school officials, uh, have the ability to bring an advocate to be there on their behalf, but there's no mechanism in the state of Maryland to really identify, you know, what a true advocate is. Obviously, you have some um, organizations that deal with um, uh, students with special needs that are known, but you also have individuals out there that say that they're advocates, and so uh, currently they may be assisting uh, parents. And so what this uh, proposed legislation would do is just create this voluntary program where individuals that uh, want to be special education advocates for parents and, and students uh, 
special education parents and students um, would go through this voluntary certification process. So it kind of gives, I don't want to say the stamp of approval uh, by MSTE, but certainly some training, examination, and some sort of um, requirements and that have been established by uh, the Maryland State Department of Education if this were to move forward. Okay, so the training would be provided by MSDE? Yes, so this would require MSDE to establish the program, and so it would be an online training or webinar. Uh, the individual has to be 21 years old, would have to be an individual of good moral character, which is why one of the recommendations is to kind of further define what that means. Um, someone would have to uh, do the training and then follow up with an online exam. That would all be created by the Maryland State Department of Education. I guess what my, my I don't know if it's a question or just a concern, <clears throat> when we're talking about someone advocating for a student, they're advocating to the school system, correct? They're, they're, ad, they're helping that student get the services from the school system is what the purpose is, correct? Yeah, that could be a purpose right. of an advocate. I think so, they serve many roles. So I'd be more interested in some sort of third party um, being part of that training and certification. Um, since it, it, if, if the Department of Education is the one training and certifying, um, you understand, yeah. So, um, because we're we're talking about there's the school system and then there's the family, and they're trying to come to agreement on what the student needs, correct? And so the person advocating for the student is being trained by the school not system. by the school system by the state department of education, which is our Department of Education has oversight over all of the school systems, so it would not be the school system doing the training. So this certification program is voluntary, in other words, a, a family can still go out and get oh, of yes. an advocate. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this would just be a stamp of approval. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Mr. Granin. So quick question. So uh, some of these advocates charge for these services, right? So this would provide at least some mechanism for families to winnow out those that met these basic requirements or at least chose to submit themselves for these basic requirements and those that did not. Yeah, and that's how we see it in that having gone through the voluntary certification, it would provide parents with at least that information and knowing that these individuals have met some sort of training and knowledge requirements that has been approved by the State Department of Education. And they can charge rates in the hundreds of dollars an hour for these services, correct? So I'm not familiar with what the rates that are charged. I know that some advocates do it voluntarily, um, and there may be some that charge, but that is possible, yes. Thank you. Mrs. Hummer. I was going to echo what Mr. Granin said, that this is just another tool that parents could use as they're choosing advocates to come. And then also to broaden out that advocates don't just come for IEP meetings. They also work with um, other providers to help. Special education can be, can be complex and confusing, and to have someone who has more knowledge can help them navigate to understand the services. They have. So it's not just limited to the school system. I, I appreciate this, that parents could have another tool to evaluate and make sure they're getting the, the appropriate help that they feel that they need for their kids. I think this is a great, a, a great step forward. Okay, thank you. Um, so see no further lights. Uh, there's no further pub public comment when we call for it before. So this is a vote uh, now to support Senate Bill 1016 with amendments. Mrs. Connolly, would you please call a roll? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Granin. Aye. Ms. Corkado? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Schulheim? Aye. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Okay, that's eight in the positive, one absent. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, on other items of legislation, um, Mrs. Schulheim? Um, thank you. So, I. I'm sure you know and probably celebrated too that Senate Bill 128 um, passed and enrolled. So for all those out there listening and in the audience, um, 
second time's a charm with getting back at least some local control um, to develop our calendars um, for school systems individually to develop calendars that meet unique needs and local priority and, and all that good stuff. And it's no secret to anyone up here or anyone I have sat with many times in the audience that this is a hot button issue of mine and it will be coming up. Um, the 2019-2020 calendar will be coming back up for further um, amendments or edits um, in late April. But I wanted to, um, between now and then, it would be great to hear if staff have any recommendation for the 2019-2020 <laughs> calendar. So Dr. Lotto, if you have, um, I guess this is like, I don't know, fair warning <laughs> that this is going to come back up. And so um, I know what I want, and uh, but I would love to also hear now that we have some flexibility if there's other um, things as well. So I just wanted to take a moment and say that. Thanks. And just to add to that, so the Senate Bill 128 would just allow school systems to, it would rescind the governor's executive order, which currently requires schools to start the uh, no earlier than the Tuesday after Labor Day and end by June 15th. Um, Senate Bill 128 restores the authority back to school systems so they can decide to keep doing that or not do that. Um, so it passed as an emergency legislation. Um, and so it's gone to the governor's desk because it's uh, been sent to him before the end of session. He has six days to act. I, the governor does not agree with the legislation, so uh, we're expecting him to veto um, the bill. But because it's emergency legislation, it also has to pass with three-fifths vote, and that's what you need to override a veto. And so the expectation is that there will be a veto override of the legislation unless there's some last minute defections on, on the bill. Um, and that's one of a couple of bills dealing with school calendar um, issues uh, before the legislature this that's year. That's the only one that made it out of cross file, right? I mean. Uh, no, so there's another bill, House Bill 1078, and that deals with um, Easter Monday and that's President's right. Day and um, actually had a, so that was a House bill and it passed out of the, um, the full house. And so that would just allow schools, it would not require um, Easter Monday and President's Day to be school holidays. Currently under Maryland law, they are school holidays and so we must close. Um, and so it would just leave them, leave that up to school systems whether they decide to close on those two days. Um, there was a bill hearing today in the Senate um, Education, Health and Environmental Affairs Committee on, on the legislation. That seems to have support as well. And so the other one did hit the, the desk today, his desk. So was. it passed out of, um, so there were some amendments to Senate Bill 128 um, when it got to the House and so it had to go back to the Senate and they had to concur and so all of that happened Monday. Um, Monday was crossover which means that all bills need to cross over from the original house to the other house in order to be timely and so there was a flurry of activity at the General Assembly. They were, you know, in session multiple times to vote out legislation and so um, I'm not sure exactly when the, you know, if it's a full 24 hours later but I would count like day one being Tuesday. So um, Sundays do not count so I believe um, the governor would have to act if my numbers are correct would be Monday, no later than next Monday. But I may be wrong. So. Monday or Tuesday, but I believe it's Monday. So we'll know soon. I just had a quick question, Ms. Ortiz. Um, is there any update on the, I don't remember the number, but um, the bill that I asked about last time regarding glasses and the school system giving out glasses and to students? So that ledger, that's a good question. I believe I believe one of them, I can't remember if the House bill Sorry or the Senate bill, I believe one of them did pass okay. out of its originating really? House uh, on time, um, but I don't recall which one, which version okay. of it, but I can definitely get back to you and let no. you know. Okay, perfect, no worries. I'm it's a lot wondering. going on right now, so I I'm a little, understand. you know, yeah, frazzled yeah. with all of the, uh, lots of bill numbers running <laughs> through my head right now, sure. but yeah, uh, I, I, it, I believe it, it, one of them passed. One of, okay. One yeah, of them. I'll get back to you for sure. Okay, no worries. Thank you. You're welcome. I have 18 days left to session. Yay. Not that you're counting or No. Anything. Get my life back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Thank uh, you. Thank you.
Uh, item 6.01 is the monthly financial status report and revenue and expenditure projections. Um, any report? There's no report. No questions. Report. Questions? questions? Mrs. Shaheim. Um, thank you. Yes, I have a question on the pages titled 20, FY 2019 Operating General Fund Financial Projections. So is this, is this um, page trying to indicate what we expect to have at the end of the fiscal year? Oh, but there, you're there. Hello. For the record, Alex Shack, new Chief Operating Officer. Key Director of Financial Operations. And essentially, the uh, page is exactly as it's stated. It's talking about changes uh, to expenses within each category and whether the uh, expense category is going to uh, essentially balance at least to zero or face a deficit condition. We don't at the end of the fiscal year? Condition as of the end of the fiscal year. That completely is contrary to what we discussed during the budget process of having a, a fund balance? Are you saying that there is no fund balance as a result of this page? Like, I'm a little confused. We're saying that in terms of our, our revenues and our expenditures are currently in alignment and we're not facing a negative category in any of those uh, state categories. Wonderful. And so you still expect the fund balance, the, the fund balance at the end of the year to um, be as was, was stated before in writing north of 13 million. Correct. Somewhere. Otherwise, we'd have a negative uh, position if our fund balance uh, didn't amass to at least a $13 million number. Yep. Thank you for um, for that. And I thought I had one more. It's not coming to me immediately. Let me let me have a look for a sec. While we're waiting, any, any other board questions? Um, Would make something up real quick. No, <laughs> no, no. I'm good. I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. The rest of it makes sense. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, any public comment? Seeing none. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll now move to item 6.02, which is transportation consultant RFP. We, no. Because mm -mm. uh, we're doing negotiations next. Yours. Yeah, yeah Ms. Shine. Um, so first, thank you again for putting this together. And um, as you all know, because I sent everyone an email and um, thank you. Well, I cc'd everyone about some minor, um, what I thought were minor changes. So thank you for. It looks like those were incorporated. And um, I hope you that. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased with the scope of work here. I just want to state that for the for the record, and I'm really grateful that we're at this point. And I I know that that there are several more steps in this process, but the first very, very, very important step is for us to hopefully approve this scope of work. And then through my conversation with Dr. Arlotto, it I think that the next step after that would be to determine the timeline for deployment of said RFP and also figuring out um, the funding to fund it. So knowing that the fund balance is going to be substantial, um, I'm hoping that, that we can um, get the money together for that. And um, yeah, I would just really, I, would, I hope that we all can move forward with this as it's written. So I would move that we approve the scope of work. Second. Hmm? Yeah, but it's, it's still, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but if somebody makes the motion. Right, that's what I'm saying. Somebody has to make a motion to move it to action. All right, I uh, make I'm a motion to, act, to move it to action, and I motion that we approve the scope of work as written. And I've been seconded. Second. Okay. Board comments or discussion on this? Sorry. <laughs> Catch me at the wrong moment sometimes. We just want us a new mint. Um, okay. Um, no uh, further board comments at this point. 
Um, we've got three public comment cards. Janet Norman, Lisa Van Buskirk, and Eric Fons. Good evening, board. Uh, thank you very much, Janet Norman, Annapolis High Parent. Um, it's exciting to hear you be at this stage to finally make some forward progress on very long overdue transportation um, issues that, that need to be fixed. So I appreciate that that you could be the board to step up to fix these. If you remember, it was 2014, five years ago, when the task force was convened by the Board of Ed, um, which highlighted the, the uh, CDC and American Academy of Pediatrics um, recommendations uh, that high schools not start, middle schools not start before 8.30 a.m. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that, that you can be the board to fix this issue. I'd also like to remind the board of the April 2017 testimony to the board by the principal, teachers, and parents of Mead Heights Elementary. I urge you to watch that video from April 2017 where they implored you to fix their detrimental 9.40 a.m. Starting, elementary starting time that was harming their students' learning. They explained that many of their students' military families are in military daycare from 6 a.m. waiting for school to start three hours and 40 minutes later. So um, everything you can do this fiscal year with this uh, budget surplus to move this contract forward will help fix the long festering problem um, that our students have been encountering. Uh, military families don't want you to do an empty thank you for your service. They want you to fulfill their needs. And we are honored to have them in our community, and I hope that we can fulfill the needs of all students in every level to have safe and healthy hours. Um, the college admissions scandal that has roiled and connected with so many high school parents has, has hit us because we know how hard our kids are, are stressed through the high school experience. And so many kids, literally and figuratively, figuratively are not making it through. Um, and so what you can do to relieve those stresses and give them healthy and safe hours as quickly as possible would be very appreciated. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric. Oh, there we go. I'm Eric Fons from Start School Later. Uh, I did speak at the board meeting in January about similar issues. I'm a physics professor from Anne Arundel Community College and also a single parent of a ninth grade daughter who attends Broadneck High School. <clears throat> uh, she's also in the PVA Magnet Program. I'm also on the board of directors at the Chesapeake Children's Museum, so a number of other, I mean, I'm here in a number of different capacities tonight. <clears throat> I'd once again uh, respectfully ask the board to consider later and healthier school start times. There are numerous clinical and medical studies verifying the importance of later start times with regard to student sleep cycles. <clears throat> uh, negative health effects of perpetual sleep deprivation due to excessively early school start times are well documented. Uh, in addition, the educational benefits of adequate sleep and healthier start times are that it yields better and more effective student learning. Uh, I speak not only as an educator who's observed the negative effects on my students, um, who sometimes, or frequently actually, I would say, don't, do not get adequate sleep, but also as a father of uh, a daughter who has chronic health issues. The early high school start times are not helping her learn in an optimal way and in some respects are making her health issues worse. She often returns home from school so exhausted that she has to take a nap for two or three hours after school. Um, and the sleep deprivation we've been finding is leading now to more frequent illnesses. Okay. Um, an issue that continues to be cited as a roadblock to changing school start times has been the bus transportation scheduling. This, however, I believe does not need to be a roadblock. There are many school districts around the country that have found ways to address this. So I want to go now on record as supporting the hiring of an outside consultant to help with the transportation scheduling. I think this could make a huge difference 
in getting the transportation schedule issues sorted out. Uh, this in turn would help the, uh, excuse me, help with the process of implementing later and healthier school start times. I really believe that the issues of school transportation and healthy start times are clearly connected and I think both issues can be resolved together quickly and in a way that does not create a huge financial burden on the county. And the reward ultimately will be healthier children who are also better and more effective learners. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Board of, Edu Board of Education. Is this like your shortest meeting since December? I hope. All right, I'll be quick. Uh, this is Lisa Van Busker of Start School Later, Anne Arundel County. Thank you for your continued discussion relative to improving the customer service and operations of the Transportation Department. We fully support your efforts to hire an outside consultant to make recommendations for improving procedures, operations, and bell time possibilities using the existing fund balance of about $13 million. It is very timely that just this month, the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, a study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, was published about school bus transportation. In an article in Education Weekly, this was written, and I quote, School start times is not only about busing, it's about many things. It's about the life of parents, it's about the health of teenagers, and it's about equity in the system. In most districts, transportation and school start times are intricately connected and difficult to change, even as school populations ebb and flow. Over time, that makes bus systems less efficient, more expensive, and often biased in favor of wealthier enclaves. The research found low-income high school students were more likely to face early start times than their wealthier peers, end quote. And we could say that this disparity doesn't really apply to Anne Arundel County Schools because all of our high schools start at 730, but then we'd have to remember that Phoenix Academy starts at 723. And as I've testified before, one of Phoenix Academy's buses picks up at 545, for a 71 minute, 71 minute long bus ride and arrives 27 minutes before its bell. So it's this and other similar inefficiencies that I believe an outside consultant can help AACPS better identify and correct in the interest of student health and safety. The article continued and I quote, it's a very hard policy decision. Parents often have very strong opinions about this. The algorithm is not able to make a political decision. It's only able to show many trade-offs, end quote. So to wedge a discussion of the trade-offs into your very full calendar before the full force of the budget cycle begins yet again, I urge you to consider providing to the consultant outlines of your parameters for healthy and safe school hours for all students once the consultant is hired. And I urge you to ask for an interim recommendation on the late elementary schools and the early high schools in about early October. This would allow you a few months to hash it out and consider the benefits of those schedules and the impacts that must be mitigated by those different schedules. And once you've narrowed down your choices, you can incorporate any budget requests into your fiscal year 2021 budget cycle to be implemented in the 2021-22 school year. Updated cost estimates could be provided to you by the consultant in February to make it all work. So I really thank you for moving this discussion forward. I think we're in a, moving in a positive direction and I hope that the transportation department can get the assistance that they need to be a better school system or school bus transportation system. Thank you. If, if, if I could clarify um, uh, for the board and those watching, um, Ms. Van Buskirk stated that, um, that the monies for this RFP would be um, coming from the $13 million um, fund balance that we would carry over. And I'm, I'm not sure where where you got that from, but that's not in the RFP. I just want to clarify, anybody that's listening, there's no, there's no dollar amount associated with this RFP, nor is there any place that we've ad yet identified where the money might come from to pay for this if this, continue, if this moves forward. I just want to make sure that that was clear and on the record. Thank you. Thank you. That was just my recommendation that you use the uh, fund balance. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. At this time, what, I'm just going to ask for any further public comment at this point. Y yes, ma'am. And then, oh, is it okay? Um, my name is Debbie Wood. I have one grandchild in the system and one to join next year. And I've had four children go to school in Anne Arundel County Public Schools. Why is this an if? Why are we at an if? Aren't we moving ahead to hire a consultant to use the software that was purchased years ago so that we can find ways to get kids to school at the right time? If you're asking me a question, the, the if is because it hasn't been finalized. 
has been finalized. It's not out on the street. We haven't identified a, a funding source. It's, it's in a preliminary stage right now. And also, this RFP is well beyond software. This is a, this is a pretty comprehensive look at transportation for Anne County. It's well beyond software. We have the software. We have to hire the consultant. No? The consultant for what? To use the software. Software is being used. We've, the consult, we've already hired the soft. The software is in use. But we still have the bus schedule that was put in place last year. Mm -hmm. The software is in use. Still your time so okay well I'm, I'm just questioning why we still have elementary schools that get out, get out so late and all the high schools start so early if we have software that can make it better why are we not going toward better to satisfy CDC American Pediatrics sleep science all the evidence that says you're depriving kids of being have, having functioning brains at that first period class, why are we not moving more quickly toward having them at school when they're ready to be at school? There's no answer. Okay, okay thank you for your time. Mr. Shalheim. Um, yes, I want to address that. Um, this is a, the, a, a very important first step. One of the reasons why I think it's important is because we have such late starting elementary schools. Um, my daughter, your grandson go to school together. I, I feel the pain every day. It starts at 9.35, it gets out at four in the winter. Thankfully it's not winter anymore and there's still daylight. Um, there's no outside time to play because it's getting dark. So I see this as a very important, very needed first step to address the whole of the transportation department um, and to really establish, um, you know, if there are inefficiencies, um, if there are not inefficiencies, it will give us all the whole breadth of information as well as um, options for uh, scenarios, of run options of, to see what it would cost to, um, to correct start times or to move them in any form or fashion. So um, again, I am so happy that we're at this point and um, I, have a, I have a little bit of a question for Mr. Sheknovich. There was a, a suggestion that we have an interim recommendation about the late starting elementary schools and I wonder is that can that be is that built into the second from the bottom point that reads recommendations and costs associated with changing start time? Can, can that be just wrapped up into that um, so we don't have to further amend what we have going? I'm just curious about that. Good evening once again. Um, as I testified two weeks ago, I indicated that this is essentially an eight-page shell of probably what's going to be a 40-plus page document. Uh, so there are certainly opportunities to make amendments uh, now. Um, and certainly, w as is customary, when an RFP or solicitation is out on the street, should there be questions or should we want to make other modifications, we can issue addenda uh, to the solicitation uh, and have the respondents uh, respond back to that. So. This is in no way, shape, or form proffered uh, this evening as a locked in stone document. And again, I was very clear that, in fact, this is very much not the final document. The final document is going to be many oh, more totally. pages. So, yeah. so, yes, there's opportunities to, to tweak it before it hits the, uh, the street, I'm, clearly. But to, av to avoid tweaking that, is that a minor detail that can be wrapped into that second to the last point about recommendations associated with changes to school start and dismissal times? I, I really. I really love what we have here, and I'm hopeful that it does not that that specific point doesn't require another. Do you think it would require another bullet at this point? I do not. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Grannon. I, I, I 
pose this question to Mr. Shaknovich. I, I, uh, Ma'am, I understood your question to be, is the current implementation of the software uh, at least providing some information that could lead to a revision of schedules such that high schools could start later and elementary schools could let out earlier. And the reason why I'm, I'm restating that question is if it doesn't have something to do with uh, discipline of a child or um, a, a particular uh, labor dispute or something that could come before us, I don't think it's appropriate in this forum that certain citizens' questions get answered and certain citizens' questions don't get answered. We're, you know, we're not up here to be selective in which questions we respond to. So that was a question that she's asked. I'm now posing it to you. So currently our efforts are not designed to operate the uh, software so as to affect start and stop times this upcoming September. We're looking for uh, efficiencies in routing to make sure that the software is running proficiently, that it's producing schedules that are accurate and timely, et cetera. Is the goal of the, is the, is the operating plan mission priority number one today for me and my team to change start times of a high school come September 1 of 2019? The answer to that is no. So what happens with the efficiencies that are hopefully gained through the use of the software? What, that, what change does that lead to? Uh, currently, what it's changed. Currently, what it's covering is the absorption of the increased cost with transportation. We're increasing headcount. We're increasing programmatic offerings. The miles and hours that we drive each and every year continued to increase. When you passed your uh, budget recently, you didn't have a line item specifically asking for additional funding for transportation. So our transportation costs are going up. We're trying to operate the system as effectively and efficiently as we can without having to go to the county to ask for yet more funding. So again, we're trying to make sure that this that the software is running as designed and intended. We're utilizing it to route the buses uh, to the best of our abilities, make sure that the routes and the times and the stops are affiliated with each of the youngsters that were required to transport. We're going to be importing all of the new students' addresses, the students that come to us uh, new for this upcoming year. We're going to be changing the grade level configuration so as youngsters matriculate from fifth grade to sixth grade or go from half day K to full day K or eighth grade to ninth grade, all of those changes are going to be effectuated in the software. So there's an operational part of it to make sure that the, that the trains arrive at the stations you know, on time and efficiently. And again, to the extent that we can identify efficiencies, they're used to cover costs. I indicated that the greatest efficiency probably is going to come a little bit later, and that's going to be the consolidation or elimination of potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of bus stops in the county. Um, the expectation is that if you can walk a mile to your school, you should be able to walk up to a mile to your bus stop. Uh, so one of the things that we are contemplating is asking the software to analyze all of our bus stops in such a manner, certainly by eliminating hundreds, if not thousands, of community stops we could possibly identify large efficiencies in that case that can be then redeployed to potentially looking at altering start times or things like that. Uh, that is not the work plan for this upcoming September, however. It is something that we're eyeing for uh, for a following f uh, calendar or academic year. So just to restate your answer in simpler terms, and I, I hope this answers your question, as currently implemented in the software is mostly about trying to do more with a finite amount of resources in terms of school transportation. That's, that was basically your answer. Now this other thing you're saying about potentially using it to help identify elimination of hundreds, or I think you even said potentially thousands of bus stops, mm -hmm. based on the idea that a student, if they can walk a mile to school, they can walk a mile to a bus stop. That would require a policy change by this board in order to do no, that. No, that's right? currently in policy and regulation. That's currently in policy and regulation. Okay, well, that, 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 that's news to me. So, the, but th that obviously would be presented to this board before any, any elimination of bus stops started happening with the idea that st students would walk a mile now to their bus stop and then have to go from the bus stop uh, on the bus to school. That's an operational issue typically under the purview of the superintendent. It's currently within policy and regulation. We don't customarily bring the elimination of bus stops to a board of education for approval.
Well, I mean, one question I have then, is it, when you say it's about the same, walking a mile to your school obviously is not the same as walking a mile to a bus stop then having to spend time on the bus and ride the bus to school. That's not the same. That's I didn't apples proffer, and oranges. I didn't proffer that that was the same, but that is what's currently. We've been tasked with maximizing the efficiencies to try to wring out as many economies and efficiencies from the transportation systems that then redeploy it to changing start times. And I'm telling the board through my testimony that the way to get the maximum amount of efficiency ring out of the system is through the elimination and consolidation of bus stops. That is the highest return for change ratio within a transportation software implementation system. Okay. Well, I can't speak for the rest of the board, but I can say I would absolutely like to know before we start eliminating bus stops based on the premise that a student would walk a mile to the bus stop and then have to ride the bus to school. I, I would like to know that. And, and I'll remind the board that this is, um, uh, Mr. Grant for the board, this is not a new conversation. I mean, since the, uh, the concept of us getting the software and which company we would use and then the purchase of the software and the, and the initial implementation has been said there's been a number of transportation updates uh, to this board over this, uh, the last couple of years, and that has been stated on a number of occasions that the greatest efficiencies are going to be found in eliminating bus stops. That's where the greatest efficiencies are going to be found, is eliminating bus stops, which then can reduce the number of buses that are on the road, um, uh, and that's where the efficiencies will be found, and hopefully some money say that's not a new conversation before this board. Thank you, Mr. Grannon. Um, Ms. Ellis and then Ms. Shawheim. Uh, the idea that a student would walk a mile and then get on a bus, potentially 20 minutes, um, that is news to me. So I, I don't know if we need to visit this in our policy committee. If you and I want to put that on an agenda, let's just do it. Yeah. Um, so we could set new parameters where a student could potentially potentially walk up to half a mile and I think the or, first order of business is for us to get the information if two board members ask that right. before any bus stops are eliminated we hear about that on the basis that they walk a mile to the bus stop and then take the bus to school if we want to know about that I think the two of us can yeah there's, there's, there's different ways I think to explore those parameters but I we do, definitely do need to visit that uh, hold on for just a second, because we, we've got a motion on, on the table. We can get to a next agenda item later. I, I just want to make sure we're not crossing parliamentary procedure-wise, because we have Ms. Schalheim's motion. Um, you know, we want to talk about agenda, we can do it. it. You know, I don't know that we need to get formal motions. Sure, that's what I mean. So I, I don't want to have one motion trump another, and, and then we get lost. It wasn't a motion. It was a motion. That's why I'm clarifying right now. All right? I just don't want us to get tripped per, uh, parliamentary-wise here. So. I'm, you're good, Ms. Shawheim. I also want to put on the record that that is also news to me, um, at least, and I imagine it's news to the five new members <laughs> sitting on this board. Um, I would be absolutely against that. I don't want to draw out transportation time, whether it's by foot, by bike, by course, by bus, to school. The, the whole point is to, to minimize the, the things, at least from my point of view or else it's no better off than, than kids getting driven and clogging up roads. So th that, that was news to me, that, um, and I agree with Mr. Gunnan that we should, uh, we should be notified or we should what put it on the... What happens when the third grader misses his bus after he's walked a mile? Exactly. Wait, 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 oh, I'm still talking, please. I'm still speaking. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say is, yeah, um, yeah um, Mrs. Corkadell, I think we found another item to add to our our, our list, and um, I would love to hear from. Uh, well, I, again, I, I, the board lights are lighting up now, and board members take take priority. I, I had asked for for public comment, and then you were the first to push your button. So, let let's let the board members comment while Mr. Shaknovich is here. Miss Oaks, we will come to you. So, thank you, um, Mr. Granin, again. Yeah, I, I, my understanding, just one brief question before I, I think I'm about to make a motion, is that based on your experience, this RFP that's in this package is not sufficiently detailed to, to operate as an actual RFP, correct? 
This was a scoping document. It is not sufficiently detailed. So, for example, uh, many of the items we would add, for example, we would add uh, prohibitions against smoking on board policy, on board property. We'll put uh, the Ford meet access provisions. We'll put uh, conflict of interest provisions. We'll put uh, uh, sexual offender uh, prohibitions. So, again, this is a skeleton. This is a, a scoping document as a working document for us before it would go out on the street. It would have all of the legalese term and conditions layered onto and wrapped around what's existing before you. Okay, then I guess I would make a friendly amendment to Michelle Hunt's motion that we um, ha have this document appropriately detailed and amended so it's not so skeletal so that it can serve the purpose that I think she's intending. You accept that? Yeah. Okay. Totally. Okay. Um, Mrs. Hummer and then Mrs. Corkadal. So I just, I, I think we might be jumping a gun, of, the gun a bit on this, um, the walking the mile to the bus stop, because what I heard Mr. Shaknovitz say was he was talking about how we're utilizing the software moving forward and that one of the goals would be, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Shaknovitz, but I heard you say that you would use the software to run scenarios of bus stops, you know, a, I would imagine progressively longer. So, for instance, a half, you know, half mile walk to bus stop, a mile, and that the software could help us to run those, and then we would be able to measure the efficiency. Am I stating that correctly? That is one of the utilities of the software, correct? So it wasn't necessarily saying that we would make it be there, but that we would have data to compare, saying if we made it now, it's going to be X amount of, of time or you know X amount of walk or whatever. It's not saying specifically we're going to make every bus stop a mile, but that that is a scenario and additional information that we can gain from the software moving forward would be different different parts in that. That's That was what I understood it to be, is that that would just be a possibility moving forward of a way to use the software to gather more information about efficiencies, et cetera, within the system, not necessarily commitment to saying we're going to make bus stops a, a, a mile walk. Because I'm going to say, too, I wouldn't necessarily – I'm not for a mile walk to the bus stop either, but that's valuable data for us to have to say what if we, you know, if we, we've got, I know in my neighborhood we have dozens of buses that come through. What if we have the children walk two more blocks? You know, that's a quarter of a mile more. How much would we save? I'd be interested in seeing that in different scenarios through there long term with the software because I believe, as you said, too, that's not the goal right now. This is a moving forward type thing. Correct. Correct. And I think the scoping document says to provide scenarios, uh, identify opportunities, provide scenarios, and provide costs. And so that, that's part of this RFP scope we have is to provide different scenarios. And again, scenarios are just to give us the information. It's not a commitment to do any of them. Correct. Okay, okay great. Thank you, um, uh, Mrs. Corkadal, and then Mr. Grannon. Um, I've been listening and, and watching and observing this, and perhaps I'm a little confused. My understanding was that the transportation RFP was to conclude and recommend the things that we are now discussing. And although I do appreciate the optics of that, and uh, the revelation it would certainly carry, it sounds like, to future conversations, I'll just remind the board that we are now currently under a motion to adopt this uh, with the understanding that was reported by staff that this was a shell scope and that during the course of the expansion that we would be consulted with. And so I would strongly suggest that instead of us debating an item not currently on the agenda that staff is not prepared to fully um, review with us, that we focus on Ms. Scholheim's motion because I believe the, the, although that information is very important and relevant, it is not, I believe, directly related to her motion, which is to adopt this, adopt her motion to take to action and to move this forward. Um, so, or unless I misunderstood the motion, which does not address walking to a bus stop or any specific policy at Yeah, this that time. was a tangent. Um, um, so I, I would suggest that we get back on track and focus, and I therefore call the vote. 
Okay. Um, Ms. Oaks, if it's okay with you now, I'm, I'm, because she called the question, we'll, we'll hear from you after uh, this procedure. I, I, uh, I'm happy to delay that for her interest. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, uh, there's no good reason not to do that unless there's uh, a reason not to. Okay, so you're, you'll suspend that. Okay. Uh, uh, that thank you. Ms. Oaks, please. Thank you. Good evening. India Oaks, Hillsmere Elementary School. As with others, this is an issue I have testified on for several years too. I just to quickly talk on behalf of elementary schools who are in full support of high school's later start times while making sure elementary schools get earlier school start times. As I said two years ago, any parent knows there is a big difference between pre-adolescence and adolescence and by moving elementary schools even later, we are limiting the learning ability of our youngest students who are not only more alert in the mornings, but are more prone to lose energy quickly in the afternoon. The later start times for elementary schools also impacts the health of kids who rely on free breakfast, or the many kids whose learning ability is impacted on the timing of their medication. So yes, we need this consultant and fixed start times. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oaks, for your patience as well tonight. Um, so now the lights are, are, are coming back. So, Mr. Granin. Yeah, just a quick, uh, I have a substantive comment, but just a, a quick, um, I guess it's a point of order. I, I understood Ms. Schalheim to say that um, due to the skeletal nature of this document, she was actually uh, withdrawing her motion at this time. I'll set that aside for the moment. I just want to make it abundantly, I want to make it abundantly, I want to make it abundantly clear that I don't, I don't think I need a clarification of Mr. Shacknovitz's testimony. I think I understood him to say that that is absolutely a potential application of the software. I did not understand him to say that that is absolutely going to happen. What I want to make crystal clear to everyone in this room is that my view, and now it's been seconded by at least one other board member, so it is going to happen, is that before one bus stop, before one bus stop is eliminated based on the premise that a student can walk one mile to that bus stop and then ride the bus to school, you, are, you all are going to report to us on each and every one of those. Yes, you will, because we set policy. And in order to set policy, we have to have the information. And if you all do that, I, for one, am going to make a motion to change that policy. So if two of us direct you to report on each and every single one of those bus stops, you will absolutely do it. Mr. Light. Could someone please restate what the motion is? I will gladly restate the motion. I did not withdraw my motion at any time. I am very excited about this scope of work. This is an important first step that has to happen tonight. After we approve this, I, I do want to um, get it right back on the agenda for the next meeting for to evaluate next steps and how we proceed once said scope has been hopefully approved. Um, and so I know it's, I think your addendum was to have this fully uh, fleshed out, but how about we do this? How about we, my, motion, my original motion stands to approve this scope of work and part of the agenda item for April 3rd will include seeing it in its full glory, although I, that's a heck of a lot of trees. I'd, I'd be fine with the electronic version and also a, um, a timeline of how to proceed. Does it need to come from the board yeah. in terms of a meeting? No. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. So, okay. So, Mr. Lai was, um, I guess, reclaiming. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, I, I understand the motion to be to approve the scope of work. Yes. That's the motion. Yes. If that's the motion, I'm prepared to, to vote on that. That's why I was. Trying. But that's the motion. Right. Mr. Gilman. Mr. Gilman. I believe the first motion was to move the item to action. Yes. And then the second motion is to approve. 
Okay. So I'm waiting to take the roll right. to move the item to action. So from, so let's do this. Is um, that correct? Review to action. Review to action was already moved. It was. It's been seconded. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Aye. So, nay. Okay. So we'll record one, one vote no on that. Um, now we have Mrs. Schalheim to restate your motion. Uh, okay, I'm sorry for the confusion, um, but let's let's just go ahead and restate it for the for the record. And yes, there was a little bit of back and forth here, but I, now I think I got it. I want the motion is to approve the scope of work as it's set out. After we do that, I have some other things I'd like to add. So that's the, I move to approve said scope of work. Okay, great. Is there a second? Yes. Second. Okay, great. Second. All right. Discussion on that. I think we've already had a lot of it, but discussion on this motion, further discussion, Mrs. Hummer's light is no. lit. Oh, okay, um, great. So Mrs. Connolly, this is a vote on Ms. Schauheim's motion. Would you please call the roll? Mr. Light. Aye. Ms. Ellis. Aye. Mr. Granin. Nay. Ms. Corkadell. Ms. Urea. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Hummer. Aye. Ms. Hummer is an aye. Ms. Urea? Aye. Ms. Johan? Aye. Mr. Gillen? Aye. Seven in the positive, one in the negative, one absence. Great. Thank you. So motion carries. Uh, Mrs. Shawheim. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you all. Um, next, and please help guide me on this because I've been counseled up here too. What does it take to see this in its full, not skeleton, but the full kit and caboodle? Like what, time-wise? Like is that, are all these things that you add to an RFP standard text that you just copy and paste and then behold, there's the 40-page document, or is that going to take a substantial amount of work? And I, I ask that so I can, you can manage my expectations so we can add this to a, an upcoming agenda accordingly. So essentially, I'd characterize it as a kit of parts. So, you know, we have standard phraseology, so we would go through that inventory, that kit of parts, and glue them together according, in the right order and wrap them around uh, the material that you have um, before you. So we're not, we're not all, but this scoping part is taking clean sheets of paper and writing language anew. The items that I'm talking about are basically taking uh, from pre-established kit of parts and then appending them to uh, what's here. The, the hard part was this, not the next. Uh, That's good to know. So then I, then I'm just going to add an agenda item to, and please don't, pr please don't print this for me. I don't need to see it in its full breadth, other than electronically, perhaps. But to, to have that available for the April third meeting, and then have board discussion about timeline for where we go from there to, what it would take to get it from full breadth to, out on the street. Yeah. Okay. So do I have a second for that agenda item? Thank you. Okay. So motion's been second. I'm I turn your life. Sorry. Yeah, for um, as an agenda, we don't need a vote on it. Okay. So that's what we're. That's what's going on the next agenda. Oh, so there's no. Uh, there, there's so. Uh, Mrs. Hummer. No, no. I so. So, um, part of an RFP is to give a price, isn't it? that you're going to, if you're going to put out the bid for people to do, you're going to give them an idea of what the cost would be, correct? No, ma'am, we do not do We that. do not. So we're not, we don't give them any sort of estimate of what we get them to give us back what they would have. Customarily, that's correct. Okay, but our team will be looking into what similar things may have cost at other areas so we know if somebody comes back with a, you know, $15 million and we find it's only half a million dollars, you know, that we know what's a general range, correct? Correct. We, 
any solicitation is reviewed for uh, responsiveness, responsibleness, reasonability, et cetera. So there's a, a due diligence part that the purchasing team and the using agency, in this case mm -hmm. transportation, for example, uh, would undertake before a recommendation came back to the board for an award item. Okay. And so, and when we put out RFPs, generally what is the timeline for how long they are publicized to give people, you know, publicized for people to apply? Um, so a, mi a minimum would be one, uh, 21, I'm sorry, and that's generally uh, considered to be compliant with the state law, but depending on the complexity of a solicitation, that may not be sufficient to get it broadcasted to allow the community to absorb it, to price it, et cetera. Uh, also, if it's an item that is of a more complex nature, then sometimes we will have a uh, pre-bid meeting that we will allow uh, prospective offers to come in, uh, ask questions, get clarifications, et cetera. Uh, so again, the, the more complex a, a solicitation, the longer you want to have it out there on the street because the, probably the worst thing that can happen is to have an offer um, incorrectly digest your expectations or incorrectly price their service uh, offerings. Um, that's where contracts typically go awry. And you, I would consider this one one that is complex, I mean, because it's many moving parts. Would this be one that you would think would benefit from having pre-bid meetings with to make sure that people understand the scope and I, I would strongly advise that this is not one you would want to rush uh, expediency is not your friend in this in this type of technical solicitation it's kind of I mean I am really pleased with the breadth of the scope of this and I think if we're going to do transportation we need to look at every single element that's in there and I'm I agree I want to make sure that it's done right and that we have people that are quali that, that whoever is bidding is realizes the the magnitude of it and is capable of doing what we're asking for it so thank you okay, mrs shaheim so just so i understand you have the pre-bid meeting and then it goes on the street for a, a month I, we were having a side so I, is that what you said or how what's the average like no, I said to, to comply with the law, 21 typically, unless it's 21 emergency days? or whatever, 21 days is 21 typically, days. Okay, cool. typically right. legal you. compliant that, you know, we yeah. said at our next meeting we would talk about yeah, yes, some yes. timelines. It yeah, would not will. be my recommendation and, you know, aligned with the conversation I had my response to Ms. Hummer while we would be legally compliant, certainly at 21 uh, days. Uh, it, it may not be in your best interest to Perfect. only leave it out there for 21 days. But that, that, that this is all is very helpful and I'm learning a lot. Thank you. Okay, I see no further lights. Um, that concludes. Right? Mr. President, I move to do, to conclude. Adjourn. Adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor, aye. Opposed, no. Thank you. Thirty minutes a break or less. <laughs> no, actually, in Mexico you have more more visas. Okay. I think you have more than one, but also you are eating and playing at the same time. Oh. 
So you are playing soccer and you have your so you sandwich have here. <laughs> <laughs> and also you're always giving food to everybody and they right. are giving it to you. So we don't care about allergies. I'm not sure.